Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the way that people move. And there's a model that predicts these sort of things. It is known as Lee's Model of Migration. It was created in 1966 by a social scientist. Bet you can't guess what his name was. Yeah, it was Everett Lee. And I don't know how often you're going to see it referred to as Lee's Model of Migration. Instead, I think it's more common to refer to it using the key vocabulary. So let's start there. So let's take a look at those key terms that are associated with Lee's model of migration. And I really think there's a high chance that you're going to see these on the AP exam. So we're going to practice them quite a bit tonight. So we start out with push factors. Push factors are reasons to move from a particular location. These are the negative circumstances associated with a particular spot that are driving people to leave. They're pushing people to emigrate, to exit a particular location. Whereas pull factors are those reasons to move to a particular place. They're pulling people in. Those are the positive circumstances that draw people to immigrate into a particular location. Now, in addition to this, Lee's model also is based on the process from the source to the destination. And so the intervening obstacle is an environment or a cultural feature of the landscape that hinders migration, slows it down, hinders, it slows it down, it serves as an obstacle, it doesn't mean that it's going to stop it, though it might. It slows it down, it makes it more challenging. But in the same way that there might be an intervening obstacle, there might also be an intervening opportunity. The presence of a nearer opportunity that greatly diminishes the attractiveness of sites farther away. So as you're traveling, like, hey, this is pretty good right here. Why, why should we keep going? That's an intervening opportunity. We're going to take a look at some of these. And so this is a visual that's going to help us understand Lee's model of migration. But we have to label a couple things on here first. So on the far left, we have the source region. That's where somebody starts. And then on the far right, we have the destination. That's where they're headed. Now, remember that in the source region, there's going to be push factors. Those are the negatives. So maybe draw in little negative symbols on that side. That's what's pushing them to leave. And so they migrate. They head out. And where are they going? They're going to the area that they are pulled to. Those are the positives. So little plus signs in there. All the reasons that are pulling them to immigrate to that particular location. Now, it's important to understand that because a migrant is more likely to be familiar with their current place of residence, the source region, than with the location that they're ultimately moving to, the destination, a migrant is more likely to perceive push factors more accurately than pull factors. And it comes as a, a, a common theme that migrants often move on the basis of unrealistically positive images and expectations of the place that they're heading. You know, think of the, the streets are paved with gold. Well, they're not actually paved with gold, but people might have believed that, that it was just such a great economic opportunity, so they're going to move here to the United States. And then when they get here, uh, they realize that while it might be better than where they came from, it wasn't as easy as they thought it was going to be. And during the process of migration, there is that intervening obstacle. So this is Lee's model of migration. Now, we're going to add to this as we move forward because this is fairly simple. And it could actually be even more simple. This is a visual from one of the other textbooks that looks at the push-pull mechanism. You have push factors, negatives, that causes them to migrate to an area that they are pulled to. Pretty simple, right? All right, so let's take a look at the broad categories of push and pull factors. We've got three, economic, environmental, and cultural. Now, before we go any further with this, I want you to also kind of consider what might that ESPN DC that we talked about before, back when we introduced FRQs, how might this fit with this? Could ESPN DC, remember that's economic, social, political, environmental, demographic, and cultural, how would that fit with this? Could we go more specific than just these three broad categories? I'm going to ask that in my classroom, you do. Now, on the AP exam, they might just stop with these three and, and, and call it more simple. But anytime that we can be more detailed, 
We're going to be. So I want you to think about it through the lens of ESPN DC over the next couple of slides. All right. Now, economic and environmental push and pull factors tend to be associated with voluntary migration. We mentioned that earlier with economics. Cultural push and pull factors tend to be associated with forced migrations. Now, I'm going to give you an example of a cultural push and pull factor. I think a lot of the migration chapter is understanding real life circumstances. So having a lot of historical and contemporary examples is important. So for example, a, a good example of a forced migration associated with culture is in 1972, the dictator of Uganda, Idi Amin, expelled 50,000 Asians and Ugandans of Asian descent from his country. Now, keep in mind, Uganda is in Central Africa. And so he forced 50,000 Asians and Ugandans of Asian descent from his country. So that's a good example of a cultural push factor. But I want you to think about envir uh, environmental push factors, push and pull factors, okay? because they could kind of be associated with both. And I'll give you an example. Think of environmental natural disasters as an example. Is that voluntary or forced? Now, in addition to this, a couple of the textbooks that are approved for Human Geo actually go into a lot of detail about climate change. And one of the textbooks argues that climate change could create climate refugees, which would be a forced migration associated with the environment. For example, scientists believe that Bangladesh will be a country in danger. The population of Bangladesh is over 150 million, and the country is only about one-fifth the size of France. And it's situated on a delta where, where 230 major rivers and streams flow and, and come together. Now, you couple that with the fact that most of the country is no more than 20 feet above sea level and humans are heavily modifying, modifying the environment, which could make the situation worse. They're pumping a lot of groundwater, which is causing cities to sink. And the deforestation that's taking place in mangroves has increased erosion rates and removed natural barriers to storm surges. So if sea levels rise, Bangladesh is a country and remember, it was one of the most populous countries on Earth. This is a country that could have a huge forced migration associated with the environment, if that comes to pass. So let's take a look at some examples of push and pull factors. Now, before we get started with all these different examples, what I want you to do, I want you to label these using ESPN DC. So remember, economic, social, political, environmental, demographic, or cultural. So label them. And at the end of this, I want you to add a few more. What might be two or three more examples of push factors that would drive people away and corresponding pull factors that might pull them to a new location? Right. Now, again, with the migration chapter, a lot of examples. So I think the more, that, the more example that you've seen and heard of, the better off we'll be. So I'm going to provide a lot of examples for these. Starting at the top with unemployment. Good historical example was the fact that Rust Belt workers uh, saw unemployment rise in traditional manufacturing areas of the United States, states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, and many of these workers were pulled to southern states like Tennessee and Kentucky as new factories opened up and new economic opportunities were available. With regards to lack of safety, uh, a historical example would be anti-Mormon violence that took place in Illinois and Missouri, which led to the migration of Mormons westwards. Approximately 70,000 people arrived in the Great Salt Lake area where it was safer due to its isolation and offered opportunities for things like farming. As far as lack of services, an example that we're seeing going on right now is the fact that young educated people in less developed regions like Latin America, North Africa, the Middle East, Asia, are moving away from areas where population growth is leading to high unemployment and underemployment. And they're moving to developed regions like North America and Europe, where the aging population necessitates young workers to balance out the dependency ratio. As far as poverty, an example that we saw in the past is that farmers in rural China left as industrialization took place, machines started coming in, consolidation of the land reduced the need for the number of farmers. And many of those rural residents moved to China's large cities where there was a better chance for economic opportunity. As far as crop failure, drought, 
Uh, historical example here in the United States is that farmers in Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas moved away from those states in the 1930s after a severe drought caused people to lose their farms and many moved to California for the agricultural opportunities that were there. With regards to war and civil unrest, a lot of different examples that we could use, but one of the, the greatest ones is what happened after the partition of India. More than 200,000 Hindus and Muslims were killed as they migrated between India and the newly created Pakistan. Hindus were pulled to India because of its Hindu majority, while Muslims were pulled to East and West Pakistan that had a Muslim majority. East and West Pakistan later divided up into Pakistan and Bangladesh. And then as far as hazards go, uh, an example in fairly recent history was the earthquake and tsunami that hit Japan in 2011 and damaged the Fukushima nuclear reactor. Many of the residents were resettled to other parts of Japan as a result. Now, why don't you add a few of your own? Now, we're getting into some examples of intervening obstacles and opportunities. And again, I'm going to give you a few examples that could work. Um, I want you to add examples that would fit not just the environmental, economic, and cultural that we looked at, but also fit with ESPNDC, Economic, Social, Political, Environmental, Demographic, Cultural. All right, so let's take a look at some examples. All right, as far as intervening obstacles are concerned, an environmental obstacle would be mountains, rivers, bodies of water that might hinder or slow down migration. Political, which falls into cultural, uh, would be the, the necessity to have a passport or visa in order to leave a country or come into a country. That would slow down migration. As far as economics, very easy one, you run out of money. That would definitely slow down migration. So try and think of some other ones that maybe would fit with ESPN DC. We kind of hit environmental, political, economic. What are some other ones that might fit? Then, as far as opportunities go, economics could be new jobs along the way. And I'll give you an example of that on the next slide. Environmental, you come across some raw materials, some natural resource, a really great farmland and you decide, hey, this is a spot that I could post up in. Or cultural, moving to an area with an ethnic enclave. Now, recall from an earlier slide, what type of migration might lead to the creation of ethnic enclaves, a group of people, same nationality or background? What do we think it could be? Now, the reality of this is, that Lee's model isn't perfect. No model is perfect. So let's take a look at some examples of what this might look like in real life. So we started out with this. The source region has the push factors. Those are the negatives. The destination has the pull factors. Those are the positives. All right. So we start out with the fact that not any place is all positive or all negative. So the source region, while it has push factors, it also has what I call anti-push factors. Now, that's not a formal term for the AP exam. But the reality is, if push factors are negative, then anti-push factors are the positives. Those are the things that make it hard to leave a place. Think family. And in addition to that, the destination region isn't all positives. It might be better than where you're coming from, but it's not all positives. There are negatives that might be there. What might be something that might be a negative in a destination spot? Now, the reality is that many people will migrate, but once they hit, some hit that intervening obstacle, some are going to return. They're going to go back home. While at the same time, some will hit an intervening opportunity and end up in a completely different spot. So the reality is that while many people will migrate, relatively few will actually arrive to a place. So let me go ahead and give you a real life example of what we're seeing take place with regards to this. So many people are migrating towards the United States for better economic opportunities, things like that. But let's say that they're migrating from Central America, let's say like Guatemala. So they have to travel from Guatemala through Mexico to the United States. Well, on their way through Mexico, in Northern Mexico, there are a lot of factories called maquiladoras that provide 
better economic opportunity than many rural residents in parts of Central America like Guatemala might have. And so that might redirect their migration. Now, in addition to that, if they get to the United States, we have a border fence along our southern wall. And we have fairly strict immigration rules that have to be followed for people entering the country legally. And so that might be something that's an anti-pull factor. Hey, yeah, the economic opportunities might be better in North America, in, in the United States, but strict immigration laws, a border fence, things like that might deter people from coming in. And the economic opportunities in northern Mexico in the maquilador factories might provide the same economic opportunities better than what they had in rural Guatemala. So they end up in a different spot, for example, of an intervening opportunity. Now we saw this visual earlier, and it's got the simple one on top, the push-pull mechanism. You pushed from your source, you migrate to the area that you're pulled to. But the reality is far more complicated. There's positives, there's negatives, there's things that are uh, neutral, that are hard to leave. And when you move, it's not smooth. There are intervening obstacles. And this doesn't even factor in the intervening opportunities that might redirect them. And the destination, while it has pull factors that are positive, there's also negatives, there's also neutral characteristics that might be a little bit more challenging. So while Lee's model is a model, the reality is far more complicated. So let's take a look at the consequences of migration. Now, the, the reality is this. Every place is impacted by, by migration, whether people are leaving, whether people are coming in, whether people are just traveling through. Every place is impacted by, by migration. So we need to understand that. On the political front, Governments are going to respond to migration in different ways. And so some governments might encourage migration, for example, if they need workers like guest workers. Other countries might restrict migration, say if they're close to carrying capacity. They might pass laws that limit migrants. Now, I want you to think about this through the lens of demographics. Think about the demographic transition model. What stages do you think might encourage migration? either in or out, what areas might restrict migration, particularly coming in. So think about that through the lens of demographics as well. Even though this is a political example, think about it through demographics as well. As far as diffusion, migration facilitates the diffusion of innovations, ideas, things like that. And so when people move, they're going to bring with them their languages, their religions. They're also going to diffuse innovations, a good historical example. Are, is the trade that took place along the Silk Road helped connect areas that were very, very distant. Right? But also, we're going to see the spread of disease with this. Right? The most obvious example to that is the Colombian Exchange. Colombian Exchange killed off huge numbers of Native Americans and actually made it possible for languages like Spanish and Portuguese to be the dominant languages in those respective areas because the native population was wiped out. So there's a connection between disease and the diffusion of language and religion. And there's also a concept called brain drain. It's a vocabulary term. The loss of a developing countries, so developing, we're talking LDCs, we're talking particularly periphery, but also perhaps semi-periphery. Most educated citizens, as they emigrate, they exit, they leave, in search of better educational and career opportunities in developed countries. So we're talking MDCs, particularly the core, but it could be semi-periphery. If they're leaving periphery, there might be better opportunities in the semi-periphery. So we've got some, some variation there. So particularly young educated people like teachers, engineers, doctors, will leave LDCs in areas like Latin America, North Africa, Middle East, Asia, and they're gonna go to areas in Anglo-America, Europe, Australia, areas like that, that need workers. And the wages will typically be higher than they were in the developing country that they came from. And that's going to lead to something that we'll talk about later called remittances.
Now, I'm going to give you a couple examples, some pieces of data that we can use. The United Nations reports that about 11% of Africans with graduate or professional degrees are living in the U.S., Europe, or other core countries. 11%. Another example is that 10% of health professionals in some African countries will emigrate, will leave to go elsewhere. Now, if the if brain drain is taking place in a developing country, what do you think we might call that in a core country? It's not an official term, but they're gaining educated people. They're gaining skilled people. Could we call that brain gain? Let's talk about this more in class. Have a wonderful night, everybody. I'll see you in class.